Hey lovelies, War Baby here to drop off a treat for you today. I recently joined Christy and Kaysen from the Heartland Homicide Podcast to help them finish off their three-episode series on killer kids. If you haven't heard Heartland Homicide yet, you should give them a shot. Kaysen hears the case for the first time, then she and Christy discuss. Their show centers around cases that have taken place in America's heartland, also known as the Midwest. Kaysen, Christy, and I went over the tragic murder of Elizabeth Olton by Alyssa Bustamante, which occurred in St. Martin's, Missouri, and was the case I covered in Episode 12, The Prozac Defense. During our discussion, we mentioned Heartland's episode on Carrie Farver, which I will link, along with my episode 14, Double the Overkill, about Nikki Whitehead's murder by her twin daughters. We refer to legislation passed to prevent profit from crimes, which are generally dubbed Son of Sam laws. Thanks for that tidbit, Christy. I'll post links in the show notes so you can find Heartland Homicide and check them out. I've included the promo for The Murder in My Family, the newest podcast from Morph, who co-hosts the Criminology Podcast with Mike Ferguson, and the Crime Sphere Podcast alongside Jamie Rice of The Murderish Podcast. His focus here is giving the family members of victims a voice and a platform. Great new content from a great guy. So that's all for now, as this episode is technically a bonus. I'll have episode 22, Killer Party, available for you in just a few days. But until then, lovelies, don't be scared. We are joined today by War Baby of Murderous Minors Killer Kids Podcast. Thank you so much for being here, and we're so excited to have you on the show today. I'm excited, too. Thank you so much for having me. So, Kaysen, the case that we're talking about today is the murder of a nine-year-old, Elizabeth Olton. Of course, I would like to say just a little bit about Elizabeth before we go off on the tangent of the person that, you know, the perpetrator. So yes. Elizabeth was, like I said, nine year olds. She loved horses. She was described as a girly girl. Her favorite color was pink. She loved music and her favorite artists were Hannah Montana and Taylor Swift. I can relate to that. I know. Yep. Yeah. She was the cutest little thing too. Yeah. Um, and what year, what year was this? 2009. Yeah. And we actually just passed the ninth anniversary on October 21st, I believe. Yes, I did. I noticed that the other day and which obviously has to be such a difficult time for her family. Right. She lived there with her mom and she had an older brother and an older sister as well. I've seen mm-hmm. interviews with her, with her mom and her older sister before. And, you know, they're obviously still clearly devastated like anyone, yes. anyone likely would be. Yeah, I just can't imagine. And yeah, I'm sure that her siblings, that's probably, I mean, obviously a very difficult thing for a sibling to go through as well. I couldn't imagine It is. I've noticed many, many times siblings, especially when they were in close proximity to one another, when something occurs, you know, it's really hard for them to live with forever. Yes. So Elizabeth was murdered by Alyssa Bustamante, and she was just 15 years old. And she kind of had a rough start in her life, too. Do you have a little bit of story about her mom? Like her her father was in jail, correct? Right. She was a 15-year-old at the time. And she had, I believe, 11-year-old twin brothers and a six-year-old sister. And so there was the four children. And her mom had, her mom had drug issues. And she had been incarcerated. Alyssa had actually seen her mom overdose when she was six years old. Eventually, after a few years, this led to them going to live with their grandparents. So when this murder takes place, the four children are in the custody of their grandparents and they live just on the other side of a wooded area from Elizabeth Olton's family. So she had seen her mom overdose on drugs. Her dad was in prison She'd been over at her grandparents for a few years, but even when she was about 13, I believe she had a pretty major suicide attempt where she tried to overdose on Tylenol. And once that took place, she was placed into, she had inpatient and outpatient extensive therapy and she was put on Prozac. So her grandparents and, you know, everyone knew that she needed treatment and she, she was actually getting treatment. In, in the years prior to this murder taking place. Right. And I think I saw it reported that didn't she just have a an adjustment of her Prozac dose a few weeks before this incident occurred? She did. 
Yeah, about two weeks before they had changed her Prozac. Right. I've seen some reports of people, you know, saying that maybe that could have had something to do with it or that kind of changed her mental stability, which I'm not really sure because I know of people like, I would say like in the 1990s, there was a huge thing about Prozac and antidepressants and children on them and how they were becoming violent and trying to blame it on the medication. But yet right. that medication is given to people who are in that situation. So it's kind of hard for them to say because of the dose or change in dose of her medication yeah. that that was cause of the situation. But it is interesting that it was so sh shortly in a such short period of time. Right. And it'll come up later. It'll come up quite a bit later. But there was no evidence really. They couldn't, you know, they couldn't really prove anything. There's no actual medical evidence that anyone could cite that actually linked Prozac usage to increased violence. So good try, but they never <laughs> quite got that one to stick. <laughs> yeah, they did try though, but yeah. So she was under pretty intensive therapy and even her own friends, you know, even her friends at school knew that she had interests and she was just a dark child. She yeah, had I, every indication, you know, her social media presence was very dark and she made comments to her friends, even as late as her 15th birthday about wanting to experience killing someone and seeing the light leave their body. Yeah. Wow. And she was really just a troubled child. Definitely. I saw that on her YouTube account, it stated that she listed her hobbies as cutting and was it killing people, literally outright killing people that she put? Literally. And which yeah. I think b being a cutter is, uh, is also kind of an interesting phenomenon in itself. But um, yeah, she also is described as being a cutter where she had like over 300 scars or so on her body from previous, you know, attempts at that or episodes of that. Right. When they arrest her and they do that full body search they do find over 300 scars and some of them from are from cuts. Some of them are from self-inflicted burns. She had bitten herself multiple times and left scars. Oh, wow. She was wow. just really, I don't know. She was just really dark and twisted. Yeah. Yeah. She was really dark and twisted. Very troubled. Did you see anything about what was in her bedroom on the walls? I did not. I don't, I, I mean, I know about her journal, but tell me more about the walls. <laughs> Well, when they go in there to search after they, you know, determine she might have something to do with this, they do find that she had written all over her walls. One of her walls was covered in letters from her father from prison. Oh. There was another area where she had written a pretty long-winded poem about Cuddy. Oh. About how, you know, pretty much how she's addicted to it. But on another section of the wall... And some of this stuff was written in her own blood. Oh. In one oh on God. one section of the wall, she had drawn like a caricature of a of a girl with cuts on her, and next to it she wrote her little sister's name. Oh. Who was six years old. Oh, that's kinda that gives me the creeps. <laughs> Did her so grandparents know about this this stuff in her room? I would have to assume that they did because it's just clearly, you can clearly see it. It's covering, just yeah. covering her bedroom walls. There's no attempt to hide it or anything. Wow. So the previous Friday before the crime, she, they had a school holiday. She chose, Alyssa took that time to go into the woods and dig two graves. So she dug two pretty rectangular holes in the ground and just left him there. Elizabeth Olton's murder would end up taking place on the following Wednesday. Her mother said that it was just a regular evening, about five o'clock. She was going to start making dinner for her and her kids. When Alyssa's younger sister, Emma, the six-year-old, comes to the door and asks if Elizabeth can play, which is something that all her kids play with the other kids over at that house. The two boys and her son play and... I don't believe that the older girls were friends, but they were, you know, more high school age and more able to pick mm -hmm. who they hung out with. But the boys and the girls definitely, the younger kids definitely played together. So she at first said no, but they begged and begged. So she said, you can go play and come back in an hour. So an hour goes by at six o'clock and she hasn't come back and now it's starting to get dark. 
So since Elizabeth's really scared of the dark, her mom is thinking, you know, there's got to be something wrong. She would have come home by now. So she calls over to Alyssa and Emma's grandparents' house. And the grandmother tells her that they never came to play at all. They start searching for her. And eventually, within about an hour, all the police are there. All the law enforcement is there. You know, they're really searching for her. They bring a helicopter. And they don't find her. So two days goes by and they start pinging her cell phone and it pings into the woods. So at the same time, authorities are going through all the records from the school to see, make sure that everyone was accounted for on that Wednesday and Thursday, at least at the very least the Thursday, the day afterward, because this happened in the evening. So they mm-hmm. realized that the only person that wasn't accounted for was this 15 year old girl mm-hmm. named Alyssa Bustamante, who's never even missed school before. And this has been, this is her first, um, unexcused absence that she's going to have had. So that's how, that's one of the ways that they decide to start questioning her. I had seen something about somebody writing them an anonymous letter as well, saying that they should question her because oh. she lives so close and she had always talked to her friends about suicide and, had mentioned to her best friend that she'd wanted to kill someone. So somebody supposedly sent a letter and they, and and not only that, but according to Elizabeth's mom, Emma was the last person that was actually with her daughter. So they go to Emma's house and that's when they see these things on the wall. And that's when, like you were saying, um, Christy about the journal, this is when they find the journal. Did you get a chance to see what was in there? Yes. Oh, I'm scared. Tell Kaysen, she's not going to believe it. <laughs> well, I have a few notes here. So the journal entry, which seems appeared to have um, been written after the crime took place. So she goes back home. So one of the things which is kind of interesting because her spelling and her grammar are so bad in the journal entry. It just shows you what her teenage mind is like. But she describes it. She kind of. She kind of writes it like she's texting. Oh, true. You're right. That's exactly how she writes yeah, it. She uses like text slang and she dates the page. So you clearly can see that it's that Wednesday. Yes. And she describes it, you know, that she just um, killed someone, that she stabbed them. She says it was amazing, pretty enjoyable. Um, oh, my God. I know. So disturbing. And then at the end, she follows up with, Kay, got to go to church now. LOL. Uh, and then she does. <laughs> and then she goes she to goes church. She goes to a church dance. Right. Yeah. And, and, and no one <laughs> knows that anything is even off with her. Oh, oh my gosh. And she puts LOL at the end. Yes. <laughs> she, she puts LOL at the end. Yes. So when they find the journal, though, she had tried to scribble out everything but that last line. Oh, right. About going to church, which is what made them suspicious. Like who writes oh, in their diary and then tries to black it out, you right. know? So it's just, you know, she's 15 years old. She's not, even though it clearly seems that she's premeditated a murder, maybe not this specific one. She's not very good at covering her tracks. Right. (laughs) Most 15 year olds probably wouldn't be. So at the same time that they see the journal, they use backlighting to be able to tell that they can see the word slit and throat. Mm -hmm. So they start to talk to her a little bit more in depthly. And at the same time, her, the phone is pinging in the woods. So local authorities, some volunteers had found one of the graves at this time. They think there's just the one grave. Did she not write? Sorry. Did she not write anything in her journal about digging the graves? It doesn't appear that she did. The the only other journal entry that I did see mentioned was about the Wednesday before the murder. So it's like October 14th. She said something about when she gets 